just one thing has made uh, uh, the cost of goods and services more expensive, and that is regulation uh, and legislation. These inhibit or prohibit people from innovating, uh, from producing, and or finding the most cost-effective solutions. And here to tell us more about uh, the obstacles to innovation uh, is Mary Perot. Mary. Thank you, John. We share John's optimism about the uh, opportunities and abundance that the sharing economy makes um, available. And, and what we're really excited about the sharing economy is its potential to eliminate barriers to opportunity, especially for the most economically and politically disadvantaged. Um, there's a lot of talk in the world and here tonight about inequality. Um, as household incomes of the middle class and working class fall behind, and the narrative is it's because jobs, wage labor jobs are being outsourced overseas and they're no longer here at home. And now we have the whole narrative about technology is eliminating all jobs, and so we're going to have to put everybody on welfare through the basic income guarantee. Um, but what's rarely discussed is the tremendous contribution made to household incomes by the informal sector. So, for example, we're from Oakland, and in Oakland, uh, which has been primarily a working class um, and poor community, we don't have a lot of slums and tenements. Our neighborhoods are mostly single family homes. And the reason for that is it's a pattern of the post war period when you had. Um, vibrant home-based economies that supplemented the wage labor that one income was being derived from it was being supplemented by in-home enterprises. So you had a vibrant seamstress community, hair salons, childcare, um, trade services, they were all being operated out of homes, as well as the precursor to Airbnb, boarding houses, right? So, but all of these thriving enterprises were outlawed by protectionist zoning and regulatory barriers. Uh, the tremendous promise of the sharing economy is the potential to bypass this regulatory um, apparatus. So as the search for new uses and greater utilization of existing assets and infrastructure will very likely strengthen economic and political pressures against the regulations that limit or prohibit uh, the, those uses, that sharing. Um, but obviously the special interests are going to fight this. Uh, Mayor de, de, de Blasio in New York has a budget projected that includes $500 million from the sales of taxi medallions over the next four years. That's a huge special interest. The city and sa county of San Francisco make something on the order of $30 million a year from taxi medallion sales, and we've seen their tremendous resistance to the loss of hotel and other tax revenues um, fighting Airbnb. Now one problem we face is the founders of Uber and other recognize that uh, these regulations affecting them are bad, but they're not extending it into a worldview that helps us all understand that government interference in the economy is a bad thing. And obviously, we would like them to be uh, more inclusive in their uh, resistance to regulation. But the good news is the sharing economy is very much a bottom-up uh, structure, right? So we're shifting from go to to come to. And it creates networks and, and contacts, and it strengthens communities. So for example, the Josephine app connects people to home cooks in their neighborhood where they can order and then go pick up their dinners from the kitchens of their neighbors. And that's creating community. You're learning who your neighbors are. You're seeing your other neighbors in that kitchen picking up their dinner as well. So in a way, the sharing economy is really attacking the state where it lives, uh, where it, it seeks to divide and conquer, pitting producers against consumers and so on. Um, and that makes it increasingly irrelevant as a regulatory agent, and that's very exciting to us. Information is becoming the rule, right? 
trust will be distributed increasingly from the bottom up, right, from community consensus versus from the top down by authority, regulation, by the government telling you what's good and what isn't. So we think the sharing economy offers the promise of completely bypassing the regulatory state. We may not have to pursue an expensive and prolonged, prolonged political process to uh, take on these special interests and defeat them. Ideally, what the sharing economy allows us to just swamp them, right? Um, if you can use your health care app to order a doctor or a home nurse aide, uh, to be at your house in an hour, and it costs some something between $99 and $200, which happens now. You no longer need to be waiting in emergency rooms for hours or paying the median average uh, cost of an emergency visit of $505. So uh, mandated government health care becomes irrelevant because you have all these options and it can just fade away under the guise of this kind of, uh, these options and this competition. So if the highly regulated taxing and, and housing cartels can be broken, we see real promise for all of these other cartels to be broken. For example, education, as John mentioned, and things such as police services and even national security. Um, we're really excited for the future. We have a new book about the future and a copy of the Independent Review. But for it to be a future of prosperity and not technocracy, we have to continue to make and communicate the moral argument as well as the economic argument. And that's what we're very much engaged in. Uh, I'm going to stop here for the interest of time, but we do have lots of more uh, material that uh, explore these ideas in depth, and we'd love to continue the conversation. So thank you. Thank you.